Hello and welcome to another episode of Loose Cannon. Did I hit live? I did hit live. Okay, I was a little concerned there when I, <laughs> that I didn't even hit it. Um, today, we are talking about the season. Uh, we we didn't jump right into the season at the start of the, the start of the season. We're like, what are we like four weeks through now? Uh, yeah, we're what technically on week five or something. Pretty sure it's week four because we have. Oh, what the hell oh, is yeah. called? Challengers proving we're only up to four on that. We we would have started right. that on week one, I think at least. Yeah. And we got presage week two, and we have three entries of presage. So I mean, it all checks out. We're on week four, uh, and you know we we uh, we didn't want to start week one because you never know anything that's going on in the first week, especially if it's only a few days after. And, uh, you know, now we've had, we've had four weeks, we've had developing story and it's continuing beyond this point, but I feel like it's a pretty good, uh, time to jump on to the season and just kind of give a, a breakdown of what's happening for anyone. Who's like, I mostly understand, but what's some of the, uh, opinions and finer details of, uh, these, these two people, we're here to answer that, that these two people question. <laughs> So, uh, do you, you want to uh, just jump right in with your item of the week? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is this button? <laughs> Cue it up. Yeah, it's it's all set. It's all on screen. Let's go. All right, cool. So uh, this last week was the lore card was. Um, <laughs> I wanted to do something that was kind of rare pun intended i guess so the you know there's some new weapons and armor uh that people i don't think they notice a lot of people didn't notice and um but it's not legendary it's not you know exotic there's some more rares that were introduced into the game mm -hmm. um in fact uh there was a few little things that weren't pulling up on ishtar but baxter fixed it so thankfully we got we were able to see them now um, but so this one was a machine gun and it's actually pretty good i tried to play with it a little bit i mean it's not you know legendary but as mm -hmm. far as machine guns go it's pretty nice it hits really hard that's like uh, the, the machine uh, guns Soros frame yeah 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 it, it looks like the um the avalanche mm -hmm. just yeah, without the fancy it. blue yeah or the delirium uh, yeah the delirium yeah that's, that's the other one so this one is called exitus um, it technically means death or termination, um, not to be confused with exodus, which mm -hmm. is a mass exodus, a traveling away from something. Um, exodus is it's a, it's of Latin origin, um, but what's really cool about this particular item, and it took me a second, was um, I realized that the word exodus is used heavily when quoting um, Ovid, which is basically like the um, it's like the root of mythology for, for you know, Romans and Greeks and stuff like that. Um, and it basically means exitus acta probat, which means the outcome justifies the deed. Uh, so this quote comes up in everything. I mean, in pop culture, movies, everything. Um, so the flavor text is what clues you in. The flavor text is quality of construction and volume of destruction. <laughs> so what like what does that, that mean? Lamar. Yeah, there you go. It's kind of like their whole like uh, uh, familiar hmm. lore story. So quality of construction is a fundamental perception tied to the idea of good. Um, it's used to justify or validate an activity, object, or decision made. So basically quality of construction is a way to justify the means, right? Mm -hmm. The outcome justifies the deed. You know, that's where that, that quote comes in. So that, I thought that was pretty neat. That was a neat little hint to uh, what they meant by Exodus or the writer who wrote this lore card, or I mean this uh, uh, flavor text. Mm -hmm. um, so Exodus obviously, like I said, came from Ovid, uh, his metamorphosis, which was the Roman mythos, um, hoc signo vincis. It's in this sign you will win. Uh, that comes from this legend 
where the words appeared uh, next to a cross in the sky, and it was witnessed by Emperor Constantine the Great before a battle. Uh, he thought it was to foretell his victory and that it that basically his rule was predetermined by the gods, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this idea that the ruler Constantine, everything he did to get to rule, um, you know, after his victory was justified because it was a sign from God. So basically <laughs> he believed that once he saw this sign from God, uh, it washed clean anything he did uh, to gain his rule. So it's kind of like going back to the outcome justifies the deed, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like what Callus does, or it's kind of like what the, what the, um, the cabal think, you know, they think in, in, you know, it's victory or death, right? So mm -hmm. they think whatever it takes to win uh, will justify the end result. Yeah. And I so mean, it doesn't uh, more recently, uh, in the presage lore book, that's something that like, it is very obvious that Callus believes because like when people on the ship that, and even his, his loyalists believe like, that's how infectious this, this idea is it, on the glycon. He has Cabal dying. And I think it was, uh, Bado, uh, was like, yeah. yeah, that was that they signed up for it. You know, that was always a possibility and Callus succeeding which is another thing we should we should talk about in the show. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I completely <laughs> forgot about the presage updates. Um, Callus succeeding justifies everyone's death. Like that's insane. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, so that's that's really sneaky, right? So yeah. they're putting these rare items that you may not notice. So if, if you're out there playing the game, pay attention to to all the little things because mm -hmm. in all of those little things, there's so much more. And uh, something that I'm really excited about is that Bungie is going to explore that in the future. And I'll, I'll, I'll expand on that later. Mm. But um, yeah, so this particular item is tied to the newest updates, right? You know, the newest uh, season. So why not have some sort of parallelism with what's going on in the story and lore? And I mm -hmm. thought that was really cool. When you dive deep into the word Exodus and what it means here on this machine gun, it tells a story that's really similar to what, you know, you just pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, so what's really cool about this uh, quote, um, it, it's changed over time. It's morphed. So it, it became a popular motto uh, that's used today. But everybody gets everything wrong, right? As the years go by, they start to change its meaning. And But it, its origin point was very much, um, you know, the, the outcome justifies the deed. Mm -hmm. But now, now it's said as like, um, you know, with Shakespeare, all is well that ends well. You know, you've heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, you shall know them by their fruits, which is about false prophets. Uh, the end justifies the means, which is probably the most common one. Yeah. Uh, that, that was also a motto used by the Inquisition. <laughs> um, so just to expand a little bit more about quality and construction, uh, it's a fundamental perception of quality that is tied to the idea that quality is associated with what is considered good. And it's used to justify or validate an activity or job object without paying much attention to the exact meaning of the word. So like, what does that mean? In, in construction, it means that a project is completed within the defined guidelines set out in the scope of work and is considered good work or mm -hmm. quality work. But the thing about quality and why it's important here and what's really cool about this, it's a matter of perspective, right? So if you're callous, you have one perspective. If you're a guardian, you have another perspective. I mean, if you're Zavala or the crow, you have another perspective. And so quality can only be defined by the end user and must be justified. So quality is a matter of perspective that can be rationalized and changed. Uh, so the quality of work done is a subject dimension, a subjective dimension, depending on the user's perspective, mm -hmm. which is nice. So like you think of um, <coughs> Crow killing Cade, he justified that well, at the time, right? Ald Aldrin. I mean, I'm sorry, Aldrin killing Cade, he justified that at the time, but now Crow is a completely different person. So yes. it's like this, you know, it's like this duality. 
You know, uh, actually, I'm not going to say that. It's too soon to, to bring up that reference. Go on. I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's it. That's it. That's okay. the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I interrupted you and, and you were just like waiting no. for me to finish my thought because no. uh, uh, I was going to say you should do not an item, but I think it was a bounty where Glint talked or Crow talked about how Glint told him about a ship. To, yes. To say, yes. say the topic without spoiling the topic for anyone because it is only okay, I'll, two days I'll after. Just, I'll just read that one because it's really short. Um, so it was, it was pretty cool. Um, it was actually retweeted by Paul Tassi of Forbes, which I thought mm. that was pretty nice of him. I was just trying to be, you know, sneaky and say, yo, <laughs> that's a destiny item too. But anyway, Un- unrelated it, to anything that might have come out on Friday. Yeah. We're not going to talk about that, but if you know, you know, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> It was when I was, oh man, when I saw it, when I heard it, I was immediately, I looked at Leslie and I was like, oh my God, I was pointing at the TV, like, you know, what's his name in that movie? Leonardo Um, DiCaprio? Yes, that was me. I was doing that. Uh, Anyway, uh, it was actually um, from the quest line for duality. A lot of people don't know there's actually a quest for duality. (laughs) It's two steps. (laughs) You pick it up. Yeah, you pick it up. You take it to Banshee. There you go. Um, but but that's that's important because duality is tied to you know the crow. So mm-hmm. it, it's kind of interesting and important right here. So that quest uh, has a flavor text in it, and it says, "Glint told me a story about a ship that belonged to someone named Theseus. Have you heard about it, Crow?" Okay, so. The ship of Theseus is a thought experiment that raises the question of whether an object that has had all of its components replaced remains fundamentally the same object, just like Crow. So basically, it's this idea that if you have an axe and you you break the handle of the axe and you go buy a new handle of the axe, you put the handle on the axe, um, and then later on you break the, the axe head, you go buy a new axe head and you put that new axe head on your axe handle. Is it still the same axe? Right. Or if you, you know, you could apply that logic to a broom or anything. And so here it's tied to a ship because Theseus had to replace all of his planks on his ship over time. And that it went on these great vast voyages and, you know, adventures and whatnot. But when he returned after doing all of that, was it still the same ship? You know, so that's the thought experiment. It's kind of this paradox is like Crow. Is Crow still the Crow or Aldrin? You know, yeah. he's had basically all of his personality wiped and now he's a whole new guy. Yeah. And I think that's important because it's like, because that's the other side of it. In the, in the case of the ship of Theseus with, with Crow specifically, you you take the boards that are broken and rotting or whatever the case may be. Uh, Aldrin's body being dead and you restore it becoming Crow is that still Aldrin or is it a new ship and that and I guess that is kind of up to people's interpretation but I think it is a new ship in in my opinion you know unless unless they decide to keep doing the same things that Aldrin did then it's effectively still Aldrin but he's not so that's where the paradox comes into play because this is a this is a great thought experiment that's used widely all over the world. You know, they they pose it to people to bring them into a way of trying to figure out new uh, solutions to old problems. You know, by introducing this idea. So here's the thing: if you if you take down the ship and you rebuild it completely new, um, mm-hmm. and and you've basically replaced everything that's material of that ship and built it anew there was still the idea of the ship. So the idea of the ship, whether you want to call it an idea, the soul, the, um, you know, the, the, the creation of the ship, that Mm -hmm. thing that's not tangible, tactile, that you cannot touch, feel, taste, whatever that was there. Right. Even though it's not there. So some people think, because this is why it's a paradox. Some people think that 
even if you rebuild the ship, the soul is still there, and eventually it will sail the way it was sailing before. <laughs> well, see, that's what I mean. I think it, it, it's in, it's entirely dependent on was it a transitional change? Was it this board? And then so you replace board A with board B, and you continue sailing. But then on the other side of the ship, board C goes, and you replace it with board D, and you continue sailing. Like it continuously becomes the same ship. Whereas in the case of Uldren, everything died. Yeah. Everything was, totally was reused replaced. and made again something entirely new. Yeah. So Glint is basically trying to tell Uldren, Uldren you know, hey, you're, you, there's a duality here. You're not the same, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's the, my, my favorite is the uh, Cherokee proverb of the wolves. You know, there's mm-hmm. two wolves inside every human. And um, there's a good wolf and then there's a bad wolf. And, you know, they're in a constant battle and struggle. And so, you you know, that the end of that is which wolf wins in those in that battle. And it's always the one you feed. Right. So there's this idea that your soul is, you know, your soul is what it is. And you decide which part of your body, which part of your your wolf, which wolf you decide to feed is going to make you who you are. <laughs> I tried to find it. I can't find it. Um, but when you said that there's two wolves inside everyone, all I could all I could think about was this um, this comic I I saw once on on Twitter, where it was uh, why do dogs tilt their heads? And it's inside the dog's head. There's a miniature version of their of themselves sitting on a uh, chair with wheels, and they tilt their head so that the dog in their head goes on to one of the sides of their brain which is thinking about food thinking about what my human is doing like things like that so, <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's all i could think of when you mentioned that i, I completely spaced out on everything else you said because i was like i need <laughs> to find right. this comic all right. All right. <laughs> okay uh but so before we begin uh there is one thing i noticed on twitter uh this did i just delete it oh no there it is I noticed on Twitter this morning that we actually got a comment yesterday, uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, from someone, uh, B Boy Steve. Uh, so, if you remember, we had I think it was in the uh, 2021 roadmap of Destiny, and uh, so in that, we know Vault of Glass is coming back, and we they talked about it today, and it, it's a segment titled. Pratus Revenge, and it says, In Season 14, the Vault of Glass will return. The team will have a lot more to say about it before launch. But there are a few things I'd like to clarify now. Our philosophy behind bringing blah, blah, blah. The important thing here, though, is Pratus Revenge. So, back in D1, Pratus Revenge was actually a... Uh, it was the Pulse Rifle, right? Uh, No, it was a sniper, wasn't it? Oh, wait. Sniper. No, because it was... Uh... Oh, it was a sniper. Yeah. I love that sniper. You had to I used it to do the um the uh the the thorn quest because it was a void. Okay. I was thinking of Prey to the timepiece, which is the pulse. Yeah, rifle. timepiece. He, the... he had a pulse rifle and a sniper rifle. Yeah. And um <clears throat> so in any case, they they were asking uh do you, with the tight ty- with the title Praetis Revenge, do you think we'll be seeing him in season 14 when we get Vault of Glass? And so I actually wanted to ask you, what are your, like, just like, uh, like, gotcha. Uh, what are your, your thoughts on seeing Praetis next season with Vault of Glass? Because in season <laughs> of the Undying, we learned that he seemed to have escaped the Vault of Glass. I can't imagine he yeah. be hanging out in it, but it could yeah. be he's the reason we go back to it. Yeah, so this is where the timey wimey thing comes into play. Yeah, um, because there was like an instance when we went into the vault of glass and we scanned the skeleton. So a lot of people believe that was Praetith, you know, dead in that timeline when we went and did that. Mm-hmm. But we know after that happened, he was very much a part of the lore and storyline, talking to us, mm-hmm. trying to transmit um, his voice across whatever or wherever he was trapped to get mm-hmm. to us. Yeah. Well, that's so that's why. To- that was his paradox. In Destiny, we 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 now have two paradoxes: uh, the perfect mm-hmm. paradox, which is Saint Fourteen's paradox, and right. Praetith's paradox, which was the first right. one. 
where we found his body. We found the remains of his death in the vault of glass. But at the same, yeah. not at the same time, but we also go back in there another time and we prevent that from happening. It, but he both died and survived. Right. So we were able to pull him out of that instance into our timeline where he is a much part, uh, a part of that. So that would be really cool. But then there's this idea, um, which is called the, the gin uh, paradox or the gin particle. Mm -hmm. uh, basically it is like um they've done romantic movies about it which you know are fundamentally flawed <laughs> but uh <laughs> they, there's this idea that like uh there's one particular movie and i can't remember the name of it but so like this man this old man gives a woman on the street a ring and said you know a young woman on the street a, a ring and uh somehow he was able to go back in time and give get or get that ring from her so is it is it technically the ring never existed at all? Because if he's in the future giving the ring to the woman later, as a reminder of him himself in the past, you know, taking the ring from her, is that does that ring exist? So like a gin particle is a theoretical particle that it, it does exist, but it also does not exist. Mm -hmm. It can it can create itself and annihilate itself. And so there's this idea that if Praetith exists. The only way he's going to exist is to constantly be trapped. Mm -hmm. As soon as you pull him out of his paradox, he's going to basically disappear. Because he did, he does exist, but he does not exist. Because in order for him to exist to us, he would have had to have died in our timeline. So if we pulled him out, he can potentially disappear. <laughs> That's the idea. Uh, wow. Whereas Saint-14 was different because he was trapped in a simulated environment mm -hmm. which don't get me started about simulations we could all just be in one right now anyway <laughs> we're in the simulation simulation it's okay yeah there's a 50 percent chance that you're in a simulation and that is proven fact as far as the characters within destiny of the game because How is there are simulations there's a fact that you can prove you're living in a simulation as long as you've been able to create a simulation. If you can create a simulation in your universe, then there is a 50% chance that you are already in a simulation. Well, that would explain. So like when I was, when I was a kid, I would like go to an amusement park with my father and I'd be like, Oh, let's go on this ride. There's absolutely no line. And I'm like, this is the best ride ever. I just want to ride this for like an hour. And I get off the ride and I try to get right back on. But all of a sudden, every person in the damn park is like, yeah. I want to be on this ride. <laughs> and it's every time. And uh, that is that is why I'm actually confident that we are in a simulation. Because they're like, no, we already saw you on that ride <laughs> once. Go, go do something else. That's awesome. You know, it's funny. I love to do this at um, the grocery store. I'm, I'm probably a maniacal person at heart. But anyway, so... Have you ever noticed when you're when you go to a grocery store that's pretty much like half capacity and you go to an aisle and you're like, oh, wow, I found something great. And then as soon as you kind of make that aware, all of a sudden, everybody wants to be on that aisle with you. <laughs> it happens all the time. Yeah. And so there's this there's this idea that people have a gravity inside them that they cannot control. And so it's I think it's the gravity of people and yeah, they maybe. gravitate. They gravitate towards activity and um, anything that can, you know, in, enhance their experience on, on life, whatever. But it, I like to go down aisles that have absolutely zero interesting crap on it and say, oh, look at that. That's awesome. And see how many people walk over there. <laughs> and without fail, <laughs> three or four people will come around from other aisles and just come to look, see what I was looking at. Yeah. And it's like nothing, you know, it's like toilet products or something. Yeah. Well that, then we'll get, the, they'll get excited and be like, that is a deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they'll, so I'm probably contributing some capitalistic agenda. That's messed up, man. <laughs> but okay. So do you think we'll see Prada uh, next season? I do, but I, I, I worry about it, you know, cause, uh, you know, he's I don't kind think of a Bungie hero. would. I don't think Bungie, even if there's like a scientific reason to believe that, I don't think they would go that route because it'd be like we've built up this character for so long, and we told yeah. you he got out, and now 
he doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> like they can't I do know. that. I know. It's be so frustrating. So like the the whole thing with the taken blight missions on Twilight Gap where we, you know, that's an interesting too thing, mm. but I won't go into that. But anyway, so like that whole thing happened, right? And we were able to somehow communicate with uh, Praetith, or he was able to get that out to us mm-hmm. using that whole experience that we had. Well, so, I mean, I, I feel like it lines up pretty nicely where, uh, so we went to do the paradox mission. That was a key moment of receiving the no time to explain. And yeah. we go in there the first time we find him dead, but we go in there the second time that the, the uh, didn't it have like a fancy name. Yes. Uh, yes. And I something love that else. Name. Paradox or paradox something. Oh man. Yes. Uh, Whatever the it was, case was, uh, we go yeah, in there it, again. It was tied to Athe- Atheon. Yeah. Bit, and, but. and so we go there, we go in there again and we find what is believed to be multiple instances of Praetith's ghost throughout the, yes. throughout the Gorgon's maze and everything. And we go to the glass throne and we fight this big taken Minotaur. And I can go off on that. I have before, but I'm always down to go off on that, but I won't. <laughs> um, we fight this big taken Minotaur and we, we hear Praetith say, tell them I lived. And so, that's like the end of it was like, tell them I lived. He's no longer dead. And we were just kind of left to believe he somehow survived. And we didn't really know what happened. And now with season of the undying so far behind us, we know that in those moments he was communicating with the Ishtar collective uh, proxies and to test the leaving the vault. And this is why I disagree that he would disappear to test his safe leaving of the vault. He threw his his pulse rifle that he modeled after the Exo Strangers into the time stream, and he wanted to warn us about the future, about the Black Fleet and the pyramids and everything that we're going through right now. So he decided to write the word "soon" in, like, carve it into the the gun, and that's the no yeah. time that to explain that we got in Destiny One. The no time that we have now is not the same gun. It's an entirely different no time to explain. And that's why it also works differently than the original no time to explain. Yeah. But also one of the most the, interesting guns. But also the stranger we see on Europa is not the one we saw originally, right? No, she is. Okay. She just But there's she, she, she but there's multiple the th- strangers. No. It's it's one looping stranger. Oh, okay. And so she 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 guided us to the Black Heart. We destroyed it, and she thought, "I did it." But then the Black Fleet came, and she's like, "God damn it!" It wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, she's she tried to prevent it from happening, but it happened anyway. But the, the the difference is because we destroyed the Black Heart, there there were years of guardians not getting corrupted. We did have uh, who was it? The uh, the Kentark Three. They got they got corrupted though. Oh yeah. Yeah. Rip. Yeah. But um so I think it we kind of got the answer to the end of the paradox mission back from D1 with Season of the Undying and I do think it is likely that we will now see Praetith. Like maybe even we'll we'll go into the Vault of Glass just for like a mission before it's even Vault of Glass raid. It's just like go in there and we go in there and we actually witness Praetith appearing from there and we get him out. But like his departure from his prison, like sets off a, a chain reaction. And like, that's what kicks off the raid. Like that'd be an awesome way to introduce the raid instead of just go back into the vault of glass. But I think it's probably just going to be go back into the vault of glass. You know, I mean, I can understand, like I can understand the task at hand, you know, for Bungie. I mean, one of the things that we we just recently got were, were the the strikes, which they were just they were just redone mm-hmm. into the game. But they use all the current models from Destiny Two because obviously they can't use the Destiny mm-hmm. One stuff. It's mm-hmm. a whole separate thing. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why you have Fallen still wearing you know, the rain, yeah, <laughs> House of rain, House of rain. Uh, outfits, but they're talking about the devils and the house of devils and stuff. Yeah, and it was a little. I was really hope like I. It, 
it didn't need to be a different strike experience. It didn't need to be Navoda. It, yeah. It could have just been the House of Devils have rebuilt Sepix Prime. Go stop them. And I'd be like, fuck yeah, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in and, in and of itself, uh, so that was like kind of, it's not really an oopsie moment because what they're doing is they're just giving you a, a, a taste of what you had before. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, when we first we got had Destiny 2, we had Ikora uh, giving us meditations, which allowed mm-hmm. us to go back and revisit missions, which was, I, I really enjoyed that. I thought that was pretty fun. Um, and then, you know, strikes but you know we got a whole strike playlist for that so it was kind of like that's a redundant thing to do so they got away from it but so to say like um you know that the house of devils or how the whatever uh the devil's layer strike and then the um saber strike being reintroduced is kind of breaking the lore it's not because it's just us revisiting a meditation basically if you want to try to think of it that way yeah and that's the best way to think about it yeah and so one of the things I was told by a little birdie <laughs> is, um, and this is why I'm bringing this up, is I don't think Volta Glass is just going to be Volta Glass. I really believe that Volta Glass is going to have new stuff. I, I don't want to hope that it will, because I really just want to keep my expectations in check. But, you know. That's yeah, true. I know it's it sucks because you know it's like the disappointment of anything really kind of weighs heavy on you. So you don't want to say one way or the other definitively because you know ultimately you're going to be disappointed regardless of the outcome. So it's it's nice not knowing, but at yeah. the same time, I really think that we're going to get something. I mean, it would be awesome if we did. I wouldn't I wouldn't be upset even if it's just like a new reason to be in there. Even if it's it's the same experience, just. I think that's that's the important difference. If they're ever going to bring something back, just give us a reason to be there. It's perfectly fine just to reuse the assets. You know, when they re they repurposed um, Devil's Lair for Siva, and it was like they rebuilt Sepix. He's now Sepix perfected. Go yeah. do the same strike again, but now it's Sepix perfected, yeah. which is basically the same thing. And everyone's like, yeah, this is awesome. Because it's another reason just to go back there. That's all we need. We don't need we don't need it to be like, instead of this boss, it's this boss. And instead of going through the Templar as well, you're going to go through this other path that you never knew existed before. It's like, we don't need to rebuild anything. Just tell just, us. Yeah, just tell us a reason. Give us, a yeah. t- give us an idea of what's happening so that we can yeah. kind of, we can reconcile what's happening, you know. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I'm gonna even share if, even if the quick. telling us is Praetith coming back and saying that um, there are versions of us looping, trapped in a loop in the, yeah. the Vault of Glass, <laughs> and it's like, how do we stop that? It's like, you have to go run Vault of Glass again. I'd be like, oh my god, really? That's awesome. I mean, I would, I would love that. Like, that would be a great reason, you know, yeah. to, to come anything. up with some stuff. Yeah. Um, I want to point something out real quick that happened on Twitter. Okay. Um, so... Patrick Dane on Twitter, uh, Blue Crew eighty six. If you don't follow him, follow him. He's a great guy. He runs Folks Fire Chat. He pointed this out, and I wasn't aware until I saw him point it out. But uh, this makes me extremely happy because I live inside this part of the world mm-hmm. of Destiny. Um, so Patrick Dane, the environmental jur- journalist, um, you know he works on a bunch of stuff, cool stuff. IG and you, you, you're a gamer, PC gamer, all that junk. Mm-hmm. He said he was lucky enough to sit down with general manager at Destiny 2, Bob Sugar. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it it was right before the state of the Destiny came out. And he provided some extra content that's available now. Um, One of the things in his article that he wrote was really important. And uh, so Blue Crew highlighted it. Here's what it said. Then other times it means we want to expand out the world. There's certainly many aspects of the narrative of the coming war between light and dark that are going to involve pulling in aspects of the world and the lore that we haven't focused on in the past. So when we do that, we really want to reward the folks who have paid attention all these years and know some of that lore that we've seen only in text so far. That's exciting. 
Yes. So that gets me extremely hyped because another little birdie told me that I would be really happy with what's going to come up next. So this is probably what they were talking about. And if that means we're going to get stories fleshed out from the lore of items that we don't know anything about, like, you know, just Albios, right? You know? (laughs) Oh, (laughs) that's a good one. I mean, just there's so much stuff in there from D1 that never got, like the Trinary Star Cult. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. just there's a flood of stuff the, that they could the go Dead with. Dead Zone Revolution. Yes. Dead Zone Revolution. Oh, my God. You know, Manhattan, Actually, Chicago. They already did that. Now that I'm realizing it, Deep Stone Crypt, we finally got to see it. We, we finally, finally got, got DSE. Yes, you're right. Man, that is going to be awesome. I can't wait for that. Yeah, so I know that the writers right now are working really hard on a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, we know that for a fact because they've they've brought several people back and they've got new people. Mm-hmm. And so they've already written most of the stuff that we're going to see next. But yeah. Um, yeah, so. I mean, it's obvious that it's obvious that they, they you can't say right now you can't say we actually need another expansion after lightfall to finish the story if you didn't already chart out the course for witch queen and lightfall and the seasons after that and be like oh wait a second you know unless you had yeah. like even if it's just like story beats like fighting Keitel, doing this doing that witch queen expansion doing this doing this doing and then right. you get to the end and you're like but that doesn't actually tie it off that the way that we want we need another like expansion of story beats to tie it off and that that was very exciting for me to see yeah i'm but, really satisfied right now with the way things are have progressed i think we've finally gotten into a groove onto uh, destiny as far as playability and mm-hmm. a storyline mm-hmm. so this season has been the best season of all because it's yeah. it's I say that mainly because I live in a world that I want the entirety of the game to be accessible to the masses, regardless of hardcore casuals, Same. or media, omni gamers, whatever. I just want you to be able to play however you want to play, but also have a true kind of uh, guideline to what's happening without having to break your mind to understand what's going on. And so they've done a really good job with this season so if you're picking up the game right now Mm -hmm. and you're playing for for the first time or coming back you have a real quick uh way of of figuring out what's happening yeah i'm not sure if i've said it on here or just with uh, other friends but you know i think i think the reason that season of the hunt felt so rough was because it's competing with the expansion they're they're two individual storylines competing for time and the expansion is such a good story and such an expansive story. You're absolutely and right. Hunt is just kind of there. And it's like, <laughs> I didn't play the hunt barely at all, but yeah. what's messed up is, um, the hunt had some very critical lore, which we, you it know, did. we talked about wow, yeah. <laughs> and we didn't re- freaking realize that until we were into this season. Mm-hmm. And so usually I'm pretty good about picking up on clues of what's going to happen next. Like, yeah. uh, you know, we had a clue about Gambit before it ever came out in the in the in the in the items of a ghost, and then um, we had the clues about you know what was going to happen with with Cade. Uh, mm-hmm. But you know, all these things you don't know them until you get the new season. But yeah. all those things are just glossed over. Whereas right now, it's kind of at the forefront. You 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 have these quest steps that are really kind of like, well, you know, it's right there in your face, and it's easy to get to. You don't have to go to some other vendor on some other planet and do a whole parallel thing to what you're already doing. Yeah, I think it's important. I think it's important for the start of the season to be about the story and about what's going on. And you can you can kind of space things out. You can give us like a whole bunch of stuff for the first month and then give us like two, three weeks off and then have like the big finale, you know? Yes. And then yeah. like that space in between and the space after, it's like this is your time to like gear up and prepare and, and just ex- enjoy the experiences and, you know. And what another thing I noticed about right now is it the way they've done this season is it has its own built-in catch-up mechanic if mm-hmm. you think about it because – at, you know, we're on week four. I didn't play any Gambit uh, at all. 
And then <laughs> right when week four came and I was like, hey, let's play some Gambit. And when I did Gambit, I completed one, two, and three, all the Gambit steps yep. just by playing Gambit. It was yep. great. So whether you're playing right now or at the end of the season trying to catch up, it's all there. So they stack. Yeah. See, that's that's what I did. The first the first three weeks, I was like still trying to hit my powerful cap and everything. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I'm going to do my three games of Gambit and my bounties or whatever the case is. And then I'm done. And so the first three weeks, those challenges were so easy in this season. I was just like, I'm not going to care about this challenge. I'm just going to play and just whatever happens, happens. And then I'm looking at it. I'm like 99% done. And I'm like, oh, okay. Just, just playing. Yeah, that's just, awesome. Just casually playing Gambit the three games. And, and this week I've done my powerful. I'm at my powerful cap. So I do my pinnacle three games. And then that's absolutely it. I'm not touching bounties anymore because I don't need to touch bounties anymore. I have these challenges. I'm, you know, right. skyrocketing. And this week it kind of... I kind of took a break from destiny uh just to play other games for a little bit and i don't have to be concerned about catching up or falling behind because next week i'm just going to double down on my gambit games and get two things for the price of one just like you're saying exactly so it's perfect it is, it yeah is really great you know so those are all the pros and obviously there are some more pros coming down you know what are the cons right now mm -hmm. is the the power gap which you're going to do away with so we'll yeah. have Another they'll no one. longer be that 50 gap chase. They'll just be a 10 gap chase, and which I'm, I'm really pinnacle. excited about. Yeah. I'm going to hit pinnacle only... every season just so that all I have to do is worry about pinnacle grind. Thank you. Yes, that's what we need because we need to be focused on what's happening in the game and submersed in that world instead mm -hmm. of trying to, you know, be victim as FOMO and running routes on one planet trying to find materials or whatever, that kind of thing. Cause that, that's Farming another this. thing that kind of like hurts it. Like in beyond light, it's like, are there new exciting things to do? It's like, yeah. Are you prepared to do them? Not really. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they did make it a lot better though. Um, yeah. Uh, I, because excuse me, uh, before last season, not this season, season of the hunt beyond light era. Uh, it used to be like a year ago. It used to be go run your lost sectors. Don't touch anything. Only run lost sectors. Get blue gear. Kill the kill the trove knight on the moon. Just do this loop for like an <laughs> hour and a half. And it was yeah. only an hour and a half. It wasn't like insane grinding, but it was like dedicate like a couple hours at the start of the season to nothing to do with the season and just get your power yeah. up, and then you can start focusing on campaign. It's like, it doesn't feel good to have that. It, no, it doesn't. So and better. it just it discourages people. And then there's that you know whole idea of well, I missed a day, so why bother now? You know. Yeah. Okay. So the the only other like the only other con that I currently have or nitpick, you know, my petty thing with the game at the moment is um, there. It's missing some clarity for people trying. I had to clarity last to season. <laughs> it's missing. It's missing. Um, the uh the how the hell do you get this thing to work uh <laughs> instruction manual mm -hmm. you know like so you know for people jumping in or for me trying to jump into the new how do i get these um engrams in the uh what are they called the umbral engram decoder machine mm -hmm. to work correctly and how do i upgrade my war table what am I doing? How do I yeah. get this to work? What is the most efficient path to make this work? There was no clear guidelines as to, you know, just in game that kind of told you, Hey, go here and do this. And this is how you upgrade this thing. I think, I think they can compact that a little bit more and make that a little bit more concise so that you don't accidentally keep focusing level or what are they called? Um, one charge engrams and miss out on your five. That's important for your quest step. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that bothers me right now is um, there just isn't a clear, concise way of playing the game when it comes to that particular new thing. Mm -hmm. but, but other so, than that, everything's great. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the, uh, the story of the season. So last season, we saw the trailer included Zavala and Osiris standing around some red legion. And in front of them was like, I think it was a hologram of the pyramid. And it was like, Oh, what's happening? Is there an alliance? Like, what is this? And it never happened last season. It happened this season. Uh, and it wasn't red legion. It was, 
Uh, does Kaido's Legion even have a name? No, just it's Blue Legion. It wasn't Red Legion. Yeah, the... It was Blue Legion. I'm sure they have an actual name. Chosen. <laughs> Actually, I wonder if they do have a name because I wonder if it's even really a Legion. Because it's just all the surviving Cabal at this point, isn't it? Right. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it it's is. The, the Cabal Exodus. They're not a legion. Yeah. It's it's her trying to yeah get as many of what's left of the Red War, the Red Legion. Yeah, the Red Guard. They're, they're trying to Red restock Guard. their numbers. Yeah. And so she comes to our system, and she has this meeting with Zavala and Osiris, and uh, she's basically, when we first saw it, I know I was very adamant against it. Like people were like, what the hell is of all? You couldn't just bow just to not have a war happen. And it's like, yeah, but at the start of the season, it's like bowing to Keitel isn't just saying like, all right, fine. You know, I'll bow, whatever. It's admitting the human race into the cabal as a, a force of slaves, just like the scions. But as the season went on, we learned that's actually no longer the case. Right. Keitel freed everything. No no race is in control of by the cabal. They're all free to come or go. If they if they just want to be like, you know, peace to the cabal and leave, go right on ahead. You're not taking our ships, but go right on ahead, you know. Yeah. The Scions are gonna rule everything. They are, and they absolutely <laughs> are. And that's why they're not leaving, because they were never slaves to begin with. They were secretly like allowing themselves into these positions to right. to gain knowledge. Yeah. But that's not how the cabal work. You know, you can't just free people, you can't just have everyone living in harmony. The difference here is that Keitel is is smarter than your average cabal. She she saw the fall of her planet uh Torah bottle. And she understood. She saw what Callus did wrong, and she saw the other extreme of what Gaul did wrong. And right. she's saying, I need to strike the middle because that is where I can succeed. That is where we, the Cabal, can survive. They've been You're doing right. things wrong for so long, they need to do something right. But so that, yeah, there's still so the counselors who are like, mm, you're not allowed to free people. Mm, you're not allowed to, to work in a... a genuine alliance you can't actually go to zavala and say we need your help can we please be an alliance we'll end all the fighting i will command it right now the counselors will not allow that so she says to bow so she's she's working that duality too you know she see mm -hmm. she sees what happens if you blindly follow the dark she sees what happens if you blindly follow the light the two mm -hmm. representatives of those of, of those uh, failed um things you know you've got callus and gall and then she's kind of walking in the middle of like, I'm not going to take those paths. This is what I know. So she has an agenda because she's seen, she's witnessed in her own eyes what happened at Toro, Toro battle. So mm -hmm. if she can see, I and mean, she also had a mentor <laughs> mm -hmm. who uh, very much kind of, you know, showed her, Oh crap, this is coming up. But yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's a, that's a whole nother can of worms pardon my pun that could come out of all of this. And uh, so, yeah, so she knows the, she knows the impending threat. So she's here. She wants to take all of these cabal uh, red guard and, and get as many as she can to go back to get, you know, mm -hmm. to save her home world or whatever. Yeah, to take, to take back tour bottle from the hive at this point, right, because uh, at this point we don't know the details that is revealed in the lore book. So I, I, we, we cannot say the details, but basically we know that Torah bottle was lost to the hive. Right. We know that much so far. Yeah. Cause that, that's, Again. that's what she's actually told us. And that's another thing. It's like, it's not only being said in the lore. It's not only being said like, I'm fighting you, but if you read the lore, you actually have a whole new understanding. If you just listen to everything, you actually gain this understanding. You see Keitel stepping away from people watching over her shoulder and talking to Zavala candidly, saying, like, you will be free. I, You will not be our slaves. Like, saying, like, this is, like, stop this fighting. You know? Like, we don't need to do this. All right. Yeah, she. So it's an it's what happens to any species once they're they're threatened with extinction. They they regardless of their d 
differing philosophies or whatever, uh, different competing things, they all, uh, you know, band together to fight to, to, to stop their own extinction event or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is, it, you know, it happens everywhere. Like a good example would be a forest fire where you have wolves and birds and, you know, bunnies and whatever, all living in this huge forest. Well, all of that is a part of the, um, the food chain, right? They all kind of kill each other, eat each other. You know, it's like a cyclical thing, but when a fire comes, they all band together and flee, you know, it's all about surviving. Right. So it's kind of the idea that she wants her race of people to survive at any cost. And so why wouldn't all of the cabal help to prevent their own extinction event? However, what's interesting to me is the scions. They don't really have a whole lot of stake in that game. (laughs) So if you think about it as it's kind of like, um, how can they, how can they take advantage of the situation? Yeah. I don't know. We're getting some good lore uh, with what's happening, even in battlegrounds. What's uh, uh, coming across, and even some of the champions we fought, and we just recently encountered, you know, a scion mm-hmm. in one of the battlegrounds. And uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's interesting. The the battlegrounds are basically, and this is this is a weird thing because they're wearing the blue armor, but they are Red Legion Cabal who are trying to uh, impress Keitel by doing whatever they're doing. So like in the case of the one, I don't know what the one on Nessus is is doing. That was one of the first ones we fought. Uh, The one on uh, Europa, Basilius, I think their name is, uh, is actually trying to steal Vex tech. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, they want to do what the Exos. Yeah, right now a Cabal commander named, yeah, that's what it was, Exotech, not Vex tech. Cabal commander named Basilius is skulking through the ice, looking for anything he can find to present to the Empress. Saladin wants you to find him and disrupt his search by challenging him to combat. And so basically, we're going through this, uh, it's called the Rite of Proving, where we disrupt what they're doing, and then we can directly challenge them. And that's what the boss fight is when they come in, and then, you know, you fight them, their shield goes up, you kill the champion, their shield goes up, you kill them. And, um... I think it's a, a really fun gameplay loop. I think it's like really engaging. It's it's kind of like an unstructured strike almost. It feels it feels to me like a, a like a horde mode or a firefight. That's exactly what it feels like to me. Uh, Halo firefight was one of the greatest things that ever happened in Halo Reach, um, oh, and it was man. a very fun, fun, fun thing to do. So this is very much like a firefight. So. Actually, uh, I've never. I'm not a Halo guy. I, I'm I'm on Sony side. You're on Microsoft side. Uh, but what I have played is in Killzone Three, and I wish it was more like this. In Killzone Three, there's actually a PvP mode where you play as one side or the other. And if you're on the the bad side, you're defending everything. If you're on the good side, yeah. you're trying to invade everything. So it's like yeah. you'll have a section of the map. And your first task is now there's this wall here and you need to yeah. blow up this wall. The, the wall. And then you, yeah. you go in, you go yeah. further and you go further. You have to do all these tasks and you get to the end. And that's how that's how the good guys win. That that's kind of what this is, just like in a super light mode, except right. nothing's being walled off from you. You just have to disrupt this, disrupt this. Now the boss. Halo Reach Halo Reach had that too. They had mm-hmm. it was called invasion. It was yeah. invasion. You could play as the elites or the bad guys and mm-hmm. keep the Spartans from taking over the, you know, the, whatever you're invading, or you could play as the Spartans and you had to, you know, prevent the invasion from Mm happening. Even not being able to play as the bad guys, even if you're only allowed to be the guardians, I think that's a a fun format that we're getting here. You know, it's kind of like strikes except strikes feel like feel more in my opinion, like an invasion to a space that we don't actually have. Whereas uh, battlegrounds feel like enemies have tried to take over your locations, your safe spaces that you've like kept. And that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. And so that's what we're trying to get that, get them the heck out of there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And the, and the other thing that's good about the battlegrounds is there's not the, you know, there's not like the darkness zone where you can, Mm -hmm. You know, and it, yeah, it's, I think it's a really good activity. 
Yeah. And so the replayability factor is is on point. Yeah. And and it's fun, you know, because who doesn't want to go in there? Like you grab a bunch of your bounties, you go in there and you shoot a bunch of aliens, and all of those bounties are completed by the end. You look at your page and you're like, wow, I got 10 bounties from this one battleground, you know? Yeah. So uh those are the first two. The third one we got uh just was that this week that we got them or last week that we got them? Uh, this sure week we week. this week we got the cool little sm- small quest from Crow. Remember? And he's standing in the uh in the separate area of the, uh, mm-hmm. the helm. Oh and he's basically like, Hey, psst, come over here, I need you to do something for me. We we actually uh, skipped over one. Uh, so we had the first two, the one on Nessus, the one on Europa, and then the third one was Val Marag, who is on uh, the Cosmodrome, and their whole goal... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The their hive. whole goal is they're going to destroy Hive territory to say, like, look, the Hive destroyed Torah Bottle, but I can destroy the Hive. Yeah. Which, Which is interesting, because they went to where the Cedar ship was landed, mm-hmm. the drop pods. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was some unfortunate uh, naming constructions with that uh, that one. Uh, uh, that was that. that was fixed. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it, you want to believe it's it's just an oversight, and I'm sure I'm sure the majority of it was an oversight. But it feels like there was an individual who chose to name it that, and mm. that's not good. Uh oh. Yeah. Mm. We, we won't get into further details about it. <laughs> the yeah, so we had now. the first one was stop the tank. The second was one was stop the cabal from getting exotech. The third one was stop the cabal from messing with the hive uh, mm. territory. And then the last one was the scion mm-hmm. on Nessus again, right? Yeah. And it was in that area that had all of the Vex portals and that one corridor that looks similar to like a Vault of Glassy looking entrance. Yep. Yeah, and that one was absolutely the most uh, interesting one and like engaging one because at the end of that one, so not this week, but the week before, we we fought that scion, and at the end of that one, you can have dialogue where uh, Crow is like, "They were using prediction engines. Can you yeah. believe what this is?" And Saladin's just like, "I don't care." Or no, not <laughs> Saladin. Osiris is just like, "I don't Cyrus, care. Yeah, I don't this care. Is not important." <laughs> And yeah. it's like it's such a switch for Osiris because <sighs> from Curse of Osiris, when we first met him, he was all like, "Oh, this this future, this this future, that we need to prevent it." And then Crow's like, "Look at this future; it's terrible." And Crow, Osiris, is like, I don't care; it's not important. <laughs> like, yeah. like he is a different person now without the light. Do you think, like, if we had to reconcile that now, do you think that's because of what he learned from trying to use, uh, you know, the the timey wimey stuff that he's been dealing with do you think he's he's kind of learned a lesson there and he's like yo no no matter what happens we're gonna screw it up so just let's stop focusing on that (laughs) i think if he had learned his lesson he would still have the light he did not learn a lesson he got punished for his his um his arrogance and that punishment stuck he never learned a lesson but the punishment stuck gotcha that's i that's what i that's how i see it and yeah. um so last week we kind of had that little tease but this week we it was revealed what the tease was what this future that crow was upset about that osiris didn't give a shit about was and it's the apparently there's a future without zavala <laughs> yeah that's yeah do you Imagine think zavala died. yeah and so everyone's talking about it now Everyone's saying, oh my god, I can't believe they might actually kill Zavala, uh, blah blah blah. Do you think Zavala will die this season, or next season, or sometime soon? Do you think that's gonna happen? No. Neither do I. <laughs> Neither do I. No. I, I don't. I think that there might be, like, a show of it, like, like, uh, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll get the, the dialogue, the, uh, banner image dialogue, where Zavala's, like, Today, uh, Cabal broke into the city and tried to assassinate me. Uh, like, they kill him, but they don't kill his ghost. And then Crow comes in and is like, ah, and kills the Cabal. Yeah. And that's how Crow <laughs> is accepted in the city, where it's like, 
He's hey, not, that's a good one. You know, that would be like a good plot like line. Yeah. That way then everybody's kind of like, oh, he redeemed himself. Now yeah. he can be a mentor. <laughs> he saves Zavala. He's not the same person he was. Like as yeah. to really and really not only do the people of the city need that, but the players of this game need that because there are people that still want to kill him. They're still like, oh, he's older and he's a bad guy. He's this. He's not. Yeah, and 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 I hate to be the buzzkill, but you know that's one of the things that bothered me about Crow's dialogue versus his flavor text because it's almost like two two crows. You know, in the mm-hmm. season of the hunt, he was like, "Kill everything, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's kill all these guys." And then in well, I Chosen, disagree. I disagree. Uh, in season of the hunt, he was like he had multiple lines where he was upset that we had to kill them. He was like, "Yeah, this is yeah, there the were only a few. option. This is like the when only he's option. Sniping, I don't like he it. Said, I have to close my eyes first. Yeah, because he like doesn't want to do it. But yeah, there's a few. <laughs> it's just a few questionable lines, and I'm just like, okay, you know, it's he's got them. He's got them this season too. And I need it. I only heard it this once, but it was in the Europa uh, battleground where there was kind of like talk about like." the cabal alliance or whatever and he's like mm, yeah we don't want an alliance with them just shoot them and then at the end of <laughs> yeah, it <what? laughs> at the end of it he's like defending the fallen and he's like maybe the cabal aren't so bad either and it's like you mm. just told me to shoot them like what pick a bro line, are you like are you split personality right now what is <laughs> happening oh my god and osiris and saladin have absolutely gone off the deep end have you heard some of their their lines like yes i have monsters just put them down that is i mean what what's really polarizing for me is saladin until this point has been just this boring monotone thing that happens in iron banner and you're just like he obviously sounds like he does not care Mm -hmm. and then now he has more passion and he's bringing back some of that siva fire that we had in uh, rise of iron you know he's got his dialogue is is more uh, fleshed out and he yeah. sounds like he actually cares about what's going on to a degree um but he yeah. he's also he's also kind of showing his butt you know he's showing that the old world warlord iron lord uh stuff isn't really applicable to what's going on right now and he's kind of got to watch his he's got to kind of adapt uh, to what's happening mm-hmm. and then you got crow in here being all snarky telling him off yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure how i feel well so i want to be clear i absolutely love that this season we have osiris telling us what to do crow telling us what to do amanda coming in zavala telling us what to do uh saladin crow osiris amanda zavala all these all these people are like involved in the narrative of the season. It's so nice to have like a multiple group of people whereas like, you know, last season if you looked at only season of the hunt, you basically just had crow. And not that crow's not awesome, but it's awesome when it's more awesome when you have more people involved cuz then it feels like the stakes are actually there. Yeah. Yeah, it really does feel like we're kind of working together to 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 prevent you know bad stuff from happening whereas before it was kind of like well you can or you 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 don't have to (laughs) and and more than just like the quest that makes them relevant like not that i didn't love the lament quest but banshee had no relevance in the season in the beyond the expansion yeah for the lament quest like it would have been awesome if throughout the europa thing it was like Banshee's an EXO, uh, Banshee's the gunsmith, we need this, or we need this, or maybe they could have, like, led into it a little bit more, where it's like, for some reason, Banshee has a lot of access to the Deepstone Crypt. We're not really <laughs> sure why. And then it's like... You Does get, he even know why? Yeah, and he doesn't know why either. It's just like, it's one of those things. And it would have been awesome to have more Banshee interaction, Yeah, is all I'm saying. Just, just the idea of Banshee before was so cool. Yeah. And I mean, they they knocked it out of the park with who Banshee is and everything and, and everything behind that. But if we could have had more character in the actual story, not adjacent to the story, that's right. always a good thing. And I understand voice actors; it's difficult. You can't have them for so long. It's expensive, etc. I just in the perfect world. Yeah, 
I mean, with all the glimmer sales, I'd like to see my money go. Down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just put, just put that, you know, I mean, I know that, I know that, you know, making a game is expensive and keeping uh, the, um, the audience satiated is necessary, you know, mm-hmm. in order to drive and to drive, to drive growth and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, there are a few things though. There are a few things though that they make quite a bit of money on whether we want to believe it or not, there are a lot of whales out there just buying up tons of silver yeah. season. And so there's, there's quite a bit of money that can be allocated to certain things. And I mean, yeah. I know, you know, that gets in the, the problem with everybody, where should they spend their money? Everybody has a voice in that. But, you know, if you really want the, the game to be successful, you need to spread it out. You, know, you can't just put all your, your your eggs in one basket and then hope everybody's going to come like when we have a whole season devoted to just trials not everybody's going to want to be here you know Mm -hmm. so you got to give everybody something and Uh, a big reason for the the game's successful um longevity is the overall story and uh, game as a whole mm mm-hmm is, is how it evolves and so if you can't constantly evolve the game and you just keep trying to say oh well this is a season about something that doesn't affect anything in the game mm-hmm. if you're not evolving in that world then people lose interest because it's not new it's just another thing that's parallel to the game not not that i i wouldn't love to see more in the game but i mean i do think that you need to give credit where it's due to say that uh there are a bunch of whales buying silver is isn't isn't a lie there absolutely are a bunch of whales buying silver but look at any other game like absolutely take your pick look at any other game who is consistent as consistently updating with anything you know Mm -hmm. right destiny is always there always pumping out stuff and people still want to complain about droughts because they have a couple (laughs) weeks without new content are you kidding me (laughs) Yeah, there's a always going to be weeks. <laughs> there's always going to be the people that are going to hate on it, no matter what happens. And yeah. it's 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 mainly to um, rationalize their own feelings about or what they've done or what they've decided to do. It's just a way to rationalize the choices that they make. They yeah. want to. It, it's like when you buy an iPhone versus an Android. You, mm-hmm. you got a dog on the other phone just to make yep. yourself feel good about the choice you made. Or PS Five yep. versus Xbox. That on um, you know all that so stuff. silly. It's it, yeah, it really is silly. Play other games, it's, uh, let people enjoy other consoles. You know, like like you play you play on Xbox. It means nothing to me. I hope Xbox gets better exclusives. That's where I stand. I hope Xbox gets better exclusives to satisfy your your uh, library of games. I have so many PS exclusives that I've just been burning through that I've sat on that I haven't played yet. Like right now, I'm playing God of War. All these games are just like I'm playing Destiny, and then when when Destiny is getting on my nerves, or because of whatever quest is getting on my nerves, or I've done the majority of the uh, of the grind and everything, I'm like, all right, put some God of War this week, and I'll get back to Destiny with a whole bunch of stuff next week. It it's, it keeps everything fresh. Right. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm yeah, gonna throw and, up the. Um, so that's, sorry? that's the other thing too. Is uh, that's the other thing too. Is it, you know you've got to realize that with the amount of stuff that's in destiny and how much money they spend on, on the employment and the offices and all the thing that's going on, look at other games and what they have in their game versus what, well, that's a great noise. You okay? Yeah. I think my, I think my wife's using the pipes outside. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded Sorry like, um, it sounded like a, uh, a laundromat dryer. It does, like when it kicks on. Yeah. Uh, uh, she, she, so I'm going to throw on the screen, I'm going to throw the Season of the Chosen roadmap. So that should be on now. Uh, we are, what day is it? This is March 7th, so we're in between the Season of the Oracle Iron Banner and the Proven Ground Strike, uh, which comes in uh, two weeks? Yep. Two weeks. Yeah, two weeks and a couple of days. So... And that's what I mean, like how I said, have like, have this like big chunk in the front of story and then have your little break. That's fine. And then have the big climax because Proving Ground Strike will obviously be the climax of, um, of the seasons 
main story. Maybe there will be like uh, a finish to the season, like after, because uh, it does say and more. Maybe after Guardian Games, there will be like a finish to the season where it's like, and now this has happened. Yeah. Kind of thing, but like the climax of the story is is happening in the battlegrounds or the proving grounds strike. Not to be confused with the battlegrounds not strikes. Yeah, oh, that'll be it. Check that out. I'll zoom in on them. That's the uh, that's the tusk lady. That's a female cabal that is now uh, in the game. Cabal with tusks, regular cabal with tusks are now an asset that I want to see more of. If if a if a cabal is female, use it. I don't care if it looks the same. Use it. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of little mini kaidos running yeah. around. Because I, I think it's important to represent them as they are. Yeah. Like, hey, you know, so when you when you stick your head inside of you know the kaido model or whatever, <laughs> you can see. Uh, yeah, I know. When you're like standing on the war table when she's talking, you can see they went ahead and made all the. Uh, inner workings underneath the helm so like there's teeth and a tongue and a you know face and all that with those big old tusks so that's like a full-on asset without the armor on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can see all kinds of variations all they'd have to do is switch her hat you know and make a different mini kaido boss or something yeah and uh so the proving ground strike i think they actually said that was going to be in a land tank again this time on Nessus. Mm. And so the last land tank we went into was Rocket's McDickface. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't seem to have rockets, but I mean, she can surprise us. Hey, that's interesting because you remember on the quest steps, they were making us go back to some of those cabal sites with the big, you know, cabal ship that we got to run into and the mm-hmm. um, lost sectors and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, that that maybe that's like a little bit of hint to what we're about to witness. So that's actually something love- else that I want to talk about really quick. Uh, that quest that you're talking about, that was one of the best quests ever. Because usually in Destiny, when you have a quest, it's like get so many kills with this gun, go to this planet yeah. and 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 kill these, uh, find this one person in this one place that's in a public zone that's difficult to find or difficult to kill, or you just have to wait around for him. You know, stuff like that. This quest is like, go to this lost sector you haven't been to in three years. And it's yeah. like, where is this place? It's like actually hidden. You actually had to look for it. And it's like this cabal themed lost sector. There's nothing special about the lost sector, but it told you to go in there. So you go in there and it's like, what did you find from this cabal computer? It's like, oh, you found coordinates for this other lost sector that you haven't been to in four years. And you go there and you go here and you go here. And it's all very, it nothing was like, tedious or exhausting it wasn't like get ten thousand submachine gun kills on the edz it was go to this lost sector use a grenade launcher while you're in there and it'll be the quest step will be done if you just equip fighting lion and kill like seven cabal that's it that's all you have to do yeah yeah that was a good because also you are reintroducing yourself to areas that you forgot you totally yeah. forgot about and i mean it, i could it, it, it fleshes that. out the world of like, look at the cabal that are still here doing things. You know, they're important what too. Thought, what I thought was neat was the sheer scale and size of a cabal ship. I had completely forgotten. So when you're looking at Kyle's ships, her huge ships up in the sky, when they're mm-hmm. landing on the ground, remember you're, that's a whole strike that we used to yeah. run. You know? <laughs> that is the, the, that is the later half of a strike that you just don't yeah. even think about. Yeah. Oh man. Good stuff. Uh, so after Proving Grounds, and this is actually something that I think is also really neat. Um, so Proving Grounds opens as Season of the Chosen, but then a week later, it opens for everyone. So it's like, if you bought the season, you get it the week early because it's important for the story. But if you didn't buy the season, you're still getting new stuff. You're still getting yeah. some, uh, new strikes, which strikes have been lacking. I, I will absolutely give that to Bungie, uh, or give <laughs> that shit to Bungie, because... We need more strikes, even if it's Devil's Lair, even if it's Saber, even if it's a rehash strike and not a new strike, we need more strikes. You know, that's, yeah. I mean, even if we got a variation of the new ones, too. <laughs> also that. That'd be that'd be cool, too. And then uh, closing out this season, it looks like we're going to have our seasonal event uh, returning for the second time, Guardian Games. 
And you kind of see the armor here it is similar but different to uh, last season's. Last season armor was more clothy across the classes and it showed all the colors kind of evenly or not evenly. I think it was like heavy on the red and then medium on the blue, light on the yellow on every class. This yeah. season, it's heavy on the yellow, heavy on the red, heavy on the blue, dependent on which class you are, which I think is a big correction on that part. Because yeah, <laughs> it was weird cool. to be like, I'm repping all the classes. Like, no, you're not. You're one. Be one. <laughs> so now you're like truly distinctively defined as, you know, mm-hmm. Hunter Bison doing the thing. Yeah. And I'm excited uh, for this set. I know it's silver. Buy it for silver. But I don't mind that. Look at that cloak. That is a glowy cloak. We've been asking for a, yeah. like the, the, what is it? The Scion Flare mantle that used to exist yeah. in D1. We've been asking for that. I'm so excited for that. And I'm excited for the Warlocks too. Look at that, that glowy vest, like the trench coat looking bit they got. That looks cool. cool. The Titans, Titans have slim fitting armor. That's all I ever hear Titans say yeah. I want. They're just like, give me small yeah. shoulder oh, pads and slimmer armor. Yeah, I don't want to be a pumpkin. You know, my wife is a Titan and she's always complaining there's not there aren't any shoulders that don't make her look, you know, ridiculous. Yeah. So, so it looks like a win yeah. for everyone, and I'm excited for that. Yeah. Plus you can you know, just, it opens up a whole door of being able to transmog later on. There are mm-hmm. certain pieces that you can use. Well, I mean this these would be uh already be ornaments. That's true. So you can just use that ornament on anything. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that I did when I, in D one is I I was a cloakless hunter. I didn't like cloaks, and I still don't like cloaks. And I've been waiting forever for a cloakless cloak item. Well, and- so I like cloaks, or I like cloaks sometimes, but the issue is ninety percent of the helmets a hunter wears is like shaped weird in the back yeah. because it's intended to have a hood on it. Cloaking, yeah. <laughs> so like, give me something with just a hood. Give me something with just a cloak. Give me something with both, you know? And if I could, if they would allow for like customization, individual customization on hood and cloak or hood up, hood down customization, that'd be so awesome. That would be so cool. I just want to wear a bandana or just, you know, a straight up, you know, uh, what is it called? The the neck thing, the gator thing. That mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I know yeah. what you mean. Uh, a yeah. gator, a neck gator. Yeah. What would actually be cool? Um, it's it's easiest to do with the hunters, but I think I think all classes could benefit from it. If um if titans could rotate their mark, like, do you want it on the side? Do you want it on the back? Do you want it on the front? Like, where do you want? Oh it? yeah, to rotate. Yeah. It? I don't know how. Uh, technically difficult this could be. Um, I'm, I'd imagine it'd be extremely technically difficult to do. Probably this. pretty hard. <laughs> but and then the same thing with the warlock bond. It's like, do you want it on your arm? Do you want it on your wrist? Do you want it on your thigh? Do you want it on your shin? You know, things like that to to give some customization as to where they go. I think that would be really neat. Uh, a perfect snap your fingers and get what you want world. Absolutely, but <laughs> don't expect Bungie to be able to make something that would probably be like uh, difficult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to um, making the classes more meaningful. Like when a Titan is just a Titan and the hunters. Like yeah. Warlock That's something that cool. people, people, people got upset about that when, when I think it was Luke Smith said that they want to like reinvest in class identity. And, you know, it doesn't sound good when it's, when it's said to like reinvest in class identity by removing some subclass trees. But it does sound good when it said, like, reinvest in class identity. So a hunter is distinctly a hunter. This ability is something that only a hunter can do. Yes, thank and you. So on. That's what that's what that's what delineated the classes for, for D1 when it first came out. I mean, when when Bungie first introduced uh, the game, you know, it was very clear what you were going to do. If you were a Titan, you were slow and strong as F. If you were a hunter, you were very fast and you could you were nimble. But if you were a warlock, you <laughs> were a glass cannon. You were <laughs> not strong at all, but dang, you dealt out a really big blow. I mean, I disagree with uh, some of those those takes because Titans were always fast. And now that, that's something that's actually really frustrating. Titans were always the fast one in D1. And then now 
warlocks are the fast one. Why aren't why were hunters never the fast one? They they have always been the nimble one. I'll, I I will yeah. give that because, but only because of the jump. You know, it's like well because you can change then, direction yeah. so easily. Yeah, from left to right. I think the titan. I think the titan was only super fast because everybody was you know breaking with the with the with the shoulder charge. You know the skate the skate yeah. titan skate. Yeah, titan skating. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, ugh. Ugh. all right well uh i think that kind of uh covers my thoughts on the season do you have anything else that you wanted to bring up no that's pretty much it i'm, I'm looking forward to you know what's going to happen in two weeks from now it's going to be way different i'm already feeling it yeah so uh the next time we're talking it's going to be something else crazy yeah. i just remembered presage so really quick on Presage. We've had Presage for three weeks now. Every week there's been new dialogue. There's been new scannables learning about this. Uh, when we had a Presage episode, we we I, I was like very adamant that Callus had died. And then uh, Presage seemed to reiterate that, that Callus was gone. But in this week's, it said that Callus successfully communicated with the darkness and has not died, but ascended through death. So it it's crazy. Uh, yeah absolutely find uh presage videos i think they i think they're on ishtar i think they have i think they've gathered the dialogue from each week it might not be on ishtar but i'm pretty sure that there are um i can't actually check the discord because i'm using discord i'm pretty sure there are members <laughs> in the discord who have the weeks recorded and prepared so it's just yeah. not on Ishtar yet if you've missed the first week or second week. And what I really hope is that Bungie keeps doing this, absolutely keep doing this when there's like these unique missions and everything. But then when there's these unique missions that have different dialogue throughout the weeks, yeah, nice. give me a selector, you know, give me week one, week two, week three, week four. So if I want to, I can just play Presage four times in a row and just hear the whole story of Presage. That would be cool. Yeah, because right now it's just random, isn't it? Well, it's it's in order. You don't get it after after it's gone. It's gone. Oh, you can't you can't hear the old dialogue if you go back then. Nope, you hear oh, the new one. That's darn it. Yeah, so it it really takes away from it, in my opinion, that you can't hear it if it's gone. It's it's exciting when you hear the new one the first time, but then when you're yeah. like, but wait, what did they say exactly the first time? It's gone. And oh, bummer. That's something that I think Bungie... That's the next thing that Bungie needs to do to enhance the player experience. Yeah. Interesting. It's got to be more on that Glycon ship. Yeah, no, we're not done yet. I, I would say uh, we are on week three. I would say I would expect... I would hope... For a whole season of Glycon. Uh, I would hope for that. But I wouldn't <laughs> expect anything beyond maybe week five. Like week five would probably... Four or five, it's probably where it's going to end. Yeah. Definitely not week three, though. That's way too open-ended. Well, they got to give you a little bit of time to catch up. So maybe... you know, Because what is there's 12 weeks, right? I mean, in what the season. I'm just thinking of the season. Oh, yeah. There's 12 weeks in the season. So you got to have a little bit of time for people to catch up and go experience a glycon ship. Yeah, but I mean that's 12 weeks. <laughs> yeah, no. But okay, so like week 10, I mean they're not done with the glycon ship, I think. You think by but week think 10 they'll still be telling glycon's story? I think there'll be something in there, yeah. I I think at week 5 it's just going to like hit a uh repetitive thing. A repetitive or maybe it'll have like no more communication, kind of like with uh, Marasov's uh, court loop. You'd go yeah, in, and she again. would say something. She'd go in, she'd say something. You go in, she'd say something, and then eventually she's just like peace, and she's gone. And you can still go in, but she's not there anymore. Where mm. it's going to be like every time that we go to the Glycon, we're going there because we're being told to go there, even if we're not actually being told to go there. Uh, right, right. And I think eventually it'll be like. Maybe we'll we'll get the intro of Osiris going, ah, oh, Guardian exploring the Glycon again. <laughs> you know, something like something simple like that, or something a new repetitive, not important dialogue that just can be can be used over and over. Yeah. Well, that makes sense then. Well, cool. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, so our next show will be on the 21st of March. Uh, I think that's just before. Yeah, that's the week before the Proving Grounds. And so um, I think next week we're probably, we should probably get back to um, the Collector's Edition Go back to that, yeah. fin- finish that <laughs> off, and then we can start doing hunt lore, and then we'll be doing chosen lore, and then we'll be doing next season lore, you know, steamrolling through everything. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Like it. If, if you want to find us, uh, we are on Twitter, just like our name is here, at Loose Cannon Show, the presented name. Uh and if you're ever looking for us on our Twitter, we have a pinned link tree le- link, uh, a, a tweet linked, a tweet pinned with a link tree le- link that has everything uh, that you sh- would probably be looking for. But if you want, if you use like a third party podcast app, it's loose cannon, C A N O N. We recently had someone looking for us and they couldn't find us because they were looking up C A N N O N with the, the two N's in the middle there, which is not our name because we have a pun and <laughs> that, that changes it apparently. Yeah. Uh, we're sneaky like that. Yeah. We're sneaky like that. So that's going to be it for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye everybody. Bye.